All right, so we're, we're going to look at um, fatigue in Eurocode 2. So this is quite a new experience for us, really, in the design of reinforced concrete and pre-stressed concrete. We haven't really paid too much attention to fatigue in the past because it wasn't really covered, well, it wasn't covered by BS500 Part 4 at all, really. And various uh, HA documents have tried to cover fatigue, but not really in a very uh, scientific way. We've still worked with sort of stress limits based on the static loading. Okay, what we've uh, what we're going to cover here is, is really just work our way through the Eurocode clauses. So fatigue is covered in uh, in section six point eight, mostly in the Eurocode two part one point one, the, the general rules and rules of buildings. But there are some modifications for bridges made in Eurocode two part two as well. So there's some general requirements for fatigue. Basically, when you when you have to consider it, when you don't have to consider it. Um, we've then got information in the code about what assumptions you make when you calculate your stress ranges for fatigue. There's also some rules about what combinations you have to use when you're calculating fatigue stresses, because that matters. The actual mean stress that you have with your cyclic load matters, influences the actual overall stress range. We look at the various SN curves for different components, because we have different fatigue behavior for um, pre-stressing steel, for reinforcing steel, straight bars, bent bars, couplers, we need to take account of all those different details. And then really the rest of what we'll talk about is mainly the um, a simplified method of designing uh, for fatigue and bridges, which involves traversing basically a fatigue vehicle across the deck. And you'll find this fatigue load model is actually very, very similar to the fatigue model we had for steelwork in BS500 and uh, Part 10. Finally, there's one, one quick thought about concrete fatigue, because as well as checking fatigue in steel, we also have to check fatigue in the concrete itself. So um, general requirements, as I say, we have to check in theory both steel and concrete. Uh, and there are some exceptions listed in 6.8.1 about when we don't need to check fatigue. And I think these need to be taken with a, a bit of a pinch of salt sometimes. Um, the exceptions, as you can see, there are for footbridges. So generally it's perceived that for footbridges we're not going to get significant stress ranges from live load. But an exception to that straight away is if your footbridge is very light and it's susceptible to vortex excitation from winds, then we do need to take account of fatigue from uh, vortex excitation. Uh, buried structures, we don't need to check fatigue there. I think the, the, the assumption is that buried structures don't actually see that much of the load. The loads tend to arch over the top through the soil. So that's the slightly hand-waving justification for not uh, not bothering with fatigue in buried structures. Similarly, foundations. Piers and columns not connected to the deck. Um, again, I take exception to that one. Um, one of the biggest problems we faced on Dubai Metro was actually fatigue. And Tom will probably know this. Um, was, was fatigue of the uh, of the reinforcement at the base of the columns. Now, they weren't connected to the deck. And they were just, just <coughs> freestanding cantilevers. But we had two problems with those uh, piers. One was that because, because it was a monopile type construction, the piles, for historic reasons, were actually not much different in diameter to the piers. It was led by the fact that the, the contractor's piling rig was of a fixed diameter. We couldn't get a bigger one. Um, which then meant that when you built the, the pier coming out of the, the monopile, there wasn't much difference in diameter. And if the pile was out of position slightly, the pier had to be in position and therefore the reinforcement cages started to clash. So to get around that problem, two things were looked at. One was using couplers to sort of connect on, but then that didn't give you the, the tolerance. Um, and also the fatigue performance of the couplers is very bad. Um, and so the other thing we did was looking at cranking the reinforcement in the piers into, into the piles. Um, not a great detail at face value, because it's a, the point of maximum bending moment at the bottom of the column, you're putting in a crank. So we had to look at lots of binding links uh, to prevent that from being a problem. But what you'll see with the Eurocode, as soon as you start cranking bars, you introduce very tight bends, you reduce the fatigue properties of the steel very, very much. And on Dubai Metro, it was, a, it was obviously a um, light rail, mostly on very tight curves, lots and lots of trains every minute, all thundering around this curve. So there was lots of repetitive cycles of centrifugal loading, bending the piers sideways. And we actually had some major problems getting this to work. And I don't, I don't think they were fabricated, invented problems. You know, I think they were, they were genuinely real problems which we had to solve. So 
a, a rather long rambling uh, discussion about bullet point four there, but I, I think you'd have to take that you know, with a bit of a pinch of salt. There are some situations where that is not a good assumption, that, that fatigue is not going to be a problem. And the other ones we've got, retaining walls, and embankments, um, and then pre-stressing and reinforcing steel completely in compression. That's reasonable, because if the, if the steel is buried in concrete that's in compression, then the strains in, which are, are controlled by the concrete, they're relatively small, and the, just the stress ranges you actually get in the steel are pretty small, so it's not generally a problem. When we calculate our stress ranges, um, in the reinforcement or pre-stressing steel, we have to comply with some uh, requirements of 6.8.2. That basically tells us when we're calculating stresses, we have to use cracked sections, and we must neglect the tensile strength of the concrete. If um, <coughs> shear lag is relevant, in the same way as if it was relevant for global analysis, then we need to consider it in the stress calculation, because that will elevate the, the stress in the reinforcement or the pre-stress potentially. And there's also a little uh, equation that, that um, if you've got mixtures of pre-stressing steel and uh, ordinary untensioned steel together as a sort of cracked effective section, then because of the different bond performances between pre-stressing steel and reinforcement, there's a tendency for actually some of the steel you thought you had, some of the stress you thought you had in the pre-stressing actually materializes in the, uh, in the reinforcement. So that needs to be taken account of as well. The Eurocode, um, as well as basically having to check bars in general, for sort of flexure, uh, for example, um, also requires us to check fatigue in shear links, which is new. Um, the way we do that is we, is we have to, uh, we, we can basically turn around the ultimate limit state formula that we have for designing the links in the first place and reverse it. So for a given shear range, we can work out a stress range in the, in the reinforcement, and we need a truss angle, again, to use in that calculation. Uh, the Eurico basically says whatever truss angle you use at the ultimate limit state in your design, so theta, we need to define theta fat, an angle that we use for the fatigue calculations, uh, which is linked to the ultimate limit state by the expression here, tan theta fat equals root tan theta. What that means is if you've gone for a flat angle, or the ultimate limit state, your angle that you use for fatigue calculations is always a bit steeper than that. And that's really representing the fact that if you go for a very flat angle at the ultimate limit state, you're invoking a lot of plasticity, probably a bit of yielding in the reinforcement to actually be got to that angle. And at the sort of serviceability range for fatigue, you're not going to have all that plasticity. You're going to, you're going to be at a steeper truss angle. We haven't done enough um, calibration exercise on this, I think. Um, but what it does show is that if you go for sort of flat truss angles and you have short spans, so the, basically the, the live load is a very high percentage of the total shear load, and you could run into problems when, with fatigue in the shear links. Whether that's real or not, I'm not sure, because I don't think there's been enough research, but that's what the, the code will tell you. If you've got longer span structures which are dead load dominated, then it generally won't be a, an issue. In terms of combinations of actions, um, we'll, we'll, we'll look in a minute at the fatigue vehicle that we have to trundle across the deck, um, but we have to do that in a combination. And what the Eurocode tells us to use is when we're, when, we're, when we're using our cyclic stress ranges from the fatigue vehicle, we need to consider at the same time the frequent combination of actions. We, we need something defined, whether, it, whether it's the frequent or the quasi-permanent in some ways, it doesn't matter. We need something to set a base level of, of stress, as you can see in this diagram here. Um, so, for example, on the left-hand end, if we're at a reasonably high sort of background tension in a particular area, so the reinforcement is, is generally in, in tension to quite a significant margin, then when we start applying the fatigue vehicle to that, all that happens is the tension gets a bit bigger or it gets a bit less. So we're, we're cycling, but the reinforcement is always remaining in tension. If we, have, if we start from a point where um, the background stress in the reinforcement is much lower, uh, in the limits or down at zero, and then we apply our cyclic loading, then as the tension increases, we're just using the cracked section. But there's a potential that we could actually take the cross section into compression. And as soon as the section goes into compression, then everything becomes much stiffer 
and the stress range for that part of the cycle in the reinforcement will be that much smaller. So effectively, it's always going to be it's always going to be um, conservative to just work out what your stress range is or what your um, what your alternating load is from the from the vehicle and just put it all on a crack section. But in some situations, that might be too conservative if you can't make it work, and you actually might want to consider that the cycle is going into compression if you, get, if you can't make it work. All right, so section 6.8.4 of the code then takes you into the um, material characteristics of different bits of steelwork, and it gives you an SN curve. Um, and the SN curve, as you can see here, is characterized by um, two different gradients, uh, one with an index of K1, one with an index of K2, and they meet at a position N star. And for different details, N star is either 10 to the 6 cycles or 10 to the 7 cycles. What you'll see is if we use the um, what's called the damage equivalent stress method, which is the basically traversing the fatigue vehicle, we'll calculate a stress range, and then we'll just compare it against the limiting stress for n star cycles. So we'll only be interested in that kink. If we've got like a, just a general set of a stress spectra, like you might have for something like a wind turbine, so we've got lots of numbers of cycles and stresses, then we'd have to actually go directly to this SN curve and read off for each particular stress what the number of resisting cycles we can have and use something like minus summation to do the calculation. But generally for bridges, we won't be doing that. And the table here basically gives you um, the values of N star, K1, and K2 um, for different types of detail. So it's probably too small for you to read from that distance, but there's requirements for straight and bent bars and you basically get the, the, the stress limit for a bent bar by um, applying a reduction factor. And the reduction factor is a function of the mandrel diameter that you bent the, uh, the bar around. So just to give you an idea of the effect of, of bending bars, if we, we, we start off with a completely straight bar, then at 10 to the 6 cycles, we have a resisting stress range here of 163 megapascals. And if we bend... Um, the reinforcement bar down to the minimum sort of mandrel diameter that we're allowed to use in the detailing standard and apply the reduction factor, then that, um, that delta, I think it drops down to something just under half. So it's quite significant. Um, we've also got uh, some stress strain curves for couplers as well. Um, it doesn't specify, or well, it actually calls them splicing devices as well rather than couplers, but, but it, it doesn't mean like laps or anything like that. It doesn't mean couplers. Um, it doesn't say what type of coupler that is, i.e. whether it's a, a mechanical coupler sec secured by screws, which tend to have very good fatigue performance, and most of the UK companies are CARES approved, which means that the, the fatigue performance of the coupler is as good as the parent bar. Um, so it doesn't distinguish whether it's one of those, which is good, or a screw threaded coupler. And most threaded couplers, if not all threaded couplers, are not sort of CARES approved because you can't demonstrate that a coupler, a threaded coupler, is, is anywhere near as good in fatigue-wise as a parent bar. Um, what the, what the, the, the curves are that we're given in the Eurocad are basically for threaded couplers. Um, if you start trying to put numbers into that, you'll, you'll find that in, in the old speak, in terms of um, BS500 part 10, a threaded coupler is sort of somewhat slightly worse than a class G detail. So you can't really put a lot of stress range into it. And that's the reason why the highways agency, not, not specifically because of the Euro code, but that's really the reason why the highways agency don't let us use threaded couplers in sort of fatigue situations. Um, and in fact, Jessica and I have just spent the last sort of three or four years replacing all the cable stays in a bridge in Penang in Malaysia because they had a stay system with threaded couplers and they were all basically breaking in fatigue. They had acoustic monitoring on, they're listening to the bars snapping. So if you do have threaded couplers with the Eurocodes until the HA sort of produced somewhere saying you can't use them again, there is no reason why you can't use a threaded coupler. Um, but you'll need to assess its fatigue performance specifically using this, um, this SN curve, and you, you'll actually find that you generally can't use them because <coughs> they won't be able to take the, uh, the fatigue loading. There's some partial factors we have to apply. Um, 
So for loading, once we've got our load, the partial factor is 1.0. And probably un unlike BS500, there is also a partial factor on the, uh, on the material resistance side. So when you've derived your resisting stress range, we have to divide that by material factor gamma S fat, which is 1.15. As I said, if you, if you have something like your wind turbine situation, you have a, a, a nice table of stress spectrum, number of cycles and stress ranges, then the process is to, for each stress range, look at what the resisting number of cycles is for that stress range. Um, you obviously know the number of, that, of, 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 uh, of cycles of that stress range, and you just use minus summation here for all of the stress ranges and just check that you've got a, a total that's less than one for adequacy. But that isn't very helpful for bridge traffic because it's like largely random. You, know, you've got, you haven't got a nice piece of paper that tells you precisely how many vehicles and what their weights are over the next 120 years. So we need a simpler method of, of doing the calculation. And the Eurico basically provides a vehicle that we have to traverse to do that. And if you're designing a highway bridge, then you've got fatigue load model 3, which as I said it looks very much like um, the BS500 part 10 model four axle um, vehicle. And if you're doing a, uh, a railway design, depending on the type of rail, you, you either pick from fatigue load model 71 or SW0. But the, the process for rail and highway bridges is going to be exactly the same in terms of how you calculate the fatigue ranges and check the stresses. So that basically brings, brings me on to the damage equivalent stress range method, which is using these vehicles. Uh, the intention is that we represent the real traffic spectrum and the real damage that that does by traversing a fictitious vehicle n star times over the deck. And that produces, that one vehicle n star times across the deck produces the same damage as the real traffic does. So there's obviously some assumptions involved in, in the making that. And that's why you're going to see a whole lot of adjustment factors coming in later on for different, um, for different assumptions or different real, real bridges. For the for load model 3, each axle is 120 kilonewtons. Um, for calibration reasons, if you're looking at uh, load effects intermediate supports, you have to multiply um, the axle loads by a further factor of 1.75. And if you're looking in the span, you have to increase the axle factors by 1.4. What we do is we just traverse the vehicle across the deck in each lane and we pick out the maximum stress and the minimum stress and that will determine what our stress range is that we have to use in the calculation. So that gives us basically um, uh, delta S C E S, the term here before we have lambda S, that, that's just the stress range from traversing that factored vehicle. Um, but then we have to multiply by lambda S which is made up of a whole series of factors. So First of all, we have a uh, five fat, which is uh, a factor which is influenced by the road surface conditions, which is another, another impact factor, basically. And we have 1.2 there for surfaces of good roughness and 1.4 for surfaces of poor roughness. And you, unfortunately, you have to make a bit of a distinction there between whether what you're designing is, is new and maintained roads or old and unmaintained roads, which requires you to sort of gaze into the future 120 years and see how your structure is going to be maintained. Um, there's no more guidance on, on it than that, I'm afraid, in the, in the Euro code. There's, another, there's a further impact factor similar to one that was in the, the old British code. Um, if you're near to an expansion joint, obviously when you pop over the expansion joint, there can be a bit of a bump. Um, so we have a factor of 1.3 for details which are actually at the expansion joint, dissipating down to a factor of 1.0, 6 metres away. So we need to... Um, work out the other parts of lambda s and there are four lambda s factors that, that make up lambda s and these are all doing different jobs to basically adjust the simplified assumption that one vehicle can replicate all of the traffic and lambda s1 depends on the specifically on the uh, influence length line that's critical the critical lobe if you like that the lobe of the influence line that's going to produce the biggest effect and you can see that for different lengths the lambda value goes up and down and the different curves are for different details so one two and three on the left hand diagram for example are couplers um, curved tendons and steel ducts and three is reinforcing steel 
And the reason why we have a lambda s factor that varies with length is, if you can imagine, the, the real spectrum of traffic is made up of lots and lots of different vehicles with different short wheelbases and long wheelbases. Um, the fictitious vehicle is just one vehicle. So you can only get, if you, if there's, in its simplest terms, you can only get equivalence of a bending moment between the vehicle and the real traffic at one span length because of the different lengths of vehicles. It won't work at any other span length, any one unique span length that they did the calibration at. So basically this, this factor of, of uh, varying things with, with different lengths is really just to correct for that, that it won't work <laughs> other than at the, specifically at the span length that they did the calibration at. Um, lambda S2 is a function of what type of road you're on because the, the, the fatigue loading um, has been derived for the, kind of the worst situation, the worst highways or whatever, anywhere. Um, so there's an assumption for the number of, of slow lane, of number of lorries in the slow lane. Um, that's knobs, and I always enjoy saying that. Um, they laugh today. <laughs> If you've got motorways, basically, then we've got a knobs value of, of 2 million, um, which is the default, which is what was used in the uh, calculation uh, for the fatigue vehicle itself. So if you put that into lambda 2, uh, a knobs of 2 divided by 2 gives you 1. The whole thing cancels out, and you get a lambda, a lambda factor that's just basically equal to 1. So there's no, no uh, factoring of the vehicle. If you go down to, um, yeah, for example, roads and motorways with medium flow rates of lorries, then the the the, uh, the value drops to 0 0.5 times 10 to the 6, um, and we can see a, a reduction in lambda s. Basically, the national the, the UK national annex or, or or BD100 is the place which is which actually sets out what these values should be um, for different HA schemes. Um, but the table here is the uh, is the value that's is kind of like the recommended values that are given in the, uh, the Eurocode itself. Lambda S3 uh, is then a factor for design life. So the, the, again, the weight of the vehicle has been derived, the fictitious vehicle has been derived to mimic the damage of the real traffic over a 100-year period. So if your design life is more than 100 years or less than 100 years, then you have to factor up or down uh, the weight of the vehicle, again, or the effect of the vehicle. And so because the UK, we have a, a national annex parameter that's, that sets our design life to 120 years, then lambda S3 becomes very, very slightly greater than 1 uh, for design in the UK. It, incidentally, I think that is, I think this is the only place in the whole Eurocode suite where our UK decision to change um, the, de the default lifetime for a bridge from 100 to 120 years actually has any impact. Otherwise, it makes no difference at all. You know, it's, it's not, there's, there's no difference in cover, for example, because we've gone from 100 to 120 years. Um, there's no difference in any other provisions. It's just in that one number there. Then we've got the final factor is lambda S4, and this is this is basically the um, the, the effects of vehicle of, of traffic in the other lanes. So we, we've traversed the, the vehicle in the, in one particular um, lane, we're giving the worst damage. Um, if we've got different numbers of lorries in in different in other lanes, then we need to take that into account as well as a factor, either up or down. Um, basically, if you've got rail bridge loading, you have to do exactly the same procedure is that calculating lambda s1, lambda s2, lambda s3, and lambda s4, uh, but dep depending on what type of um, rail loading you're considering, you have to choose one of the two uh, fatigue load models. Now I'll just finish up just with, uh, I think, a couple of slides on concrete fatigue. Um, this is covered by clause 6.8.7, and Eurocode 2 part 2 picks this up also for bridges. And there are two approaches. There's one approach where, again, you can try and uh, you, can, you can try and actually work out what your real sort of stress ranges are um, from from the traversing the fatigue model. Um, but you'll find that there isn't actually enough. Although it, re it refers you to um, Annex NN, you'll find that there actually isn't enough information there to do the calculation properly. You just, you just <laughs> I won't go into why. If you try and do it, you'll find that just half of the data is just missing. It's just not provided. Um, the, the code itself invites um, member states to fill in all that detail for you in the National Annex, but frankly we didn't even know where to start. 
uh, particularly in the UK, having not checked concrete fatigue before, we didn't have any data, so we didn't know what to do. So, <laughs> so there's nothing there. Um, but it doesn't really matter because there's a much simpler method of checking concrete fatigue that doesn't rely on actually applying the cyclic loading. You can just do it directly from um, the non-cyclic loading. So if we can satisfy the equation here, then we won't have any problem with concrete fatigue. And all, of, all this is saying is that um, under the non-cyclic loading, as long as we have a maximum stress in the concrete, sigma C max divided by FCD fat, uh, which is FCD fat is basically a, a slightly reduced version of FCD. Uh, the definition is given to you in the code. As, lo as long as that ratio is less than 0.5 plus 0.45 times the minimum stress um, that we have under the non-cyclic loading divided by FCD fat, um, then basically the design works. And I think for all, all the calibration work that we've done, that's always been satisfied. So there's no need, no need to go off and do a, a more complicated analysis. Once again, like like um, uh, like we mentioned, you have to do a, a check on fatigue in shear links. Um, we also have to do a check on concrete fatigue for shear. Um, and this is specifically thinking about the, the shear truss, you know, the, the inclined um, compression cord. And so once again, it's possible to turn the um, ultimate limit state formula round and work out what the stress uh, in the cord is. We've got about an angle theta again, which we, uh, which we need to use. And having got that stress in the compression cord, we just go back to that um, simple static requirement again and make sure that the the relationship between the maximum stress in the strut and the minimum stress, just under the just under the normal non-static uh, non-fatigue loading, is meets that requirement, and then everything's okay.